We will now begin the panel discussion. The theme of the first part is international comparison of joint patent infringement. So, I would like to introduce our panelists. First, we have Tamotsu Shoji, the presiding judge of the Intellectual Property High Court. Then, we have uh, Kumiko Katsumata, the of uh, judge of the Intellectual Property High Court. Then, we have Yasufumi Shiroyama, who is a partner and an attorney at law of Anderson Mori and the Tomotsune firm. Then, we have, from the United States Court of Appeals to the Third Court, we have Mr. Kent A. Jordan, circuit judge. Then, from the Court of Appeal of England and Wales, we have Lord Justice Colin Berth. Then, from Germany, we have the presiding judge from the Federal Court of Justice, Dr. Klaus Bacher. The moderators are, from the Intellectual Property High Court, we have Judge Tomohiro Nakajima. Then, from the Mori Hamada and Matsumoto law firm, we have partner and attorney at law, Mr. Yoshifumi Onodera. These are the people who will be speaking at today's panel discussion. I would like to ask the two moderators to facilitate the discussion from now on. So, Judge Nakajima and Attorney at Law Onodera, please begin. So, let's start the panel discussion. First of all, I'm going to explain a little bit in Japanese. There are various forms of patent infringement involving multi-entities among them, we particularly deal with the following issue. For example, if there is a patent constituted by three elements, elements A, three, A through C, on that basis, when seen without legal evaluation, entity D is engaged in acts corresponding to elements A and B, and entity T is engaged in acts corresponding to element C. In this case, today we will deal with an issue of whether such a case can be evaluated similarly to a case where D is engaged in acts corresponding to elements A through C. Additionally, this kind of case may be categorised as divided infringement, being differentiated from joint infringement, but considering factors such as the fact that in this panel discussion we look over rules in four countries, we will not distinguish between them strictly and, and just regard them as having similar concepts. There are differences between the four countries as to in what cases patent infringement can be established by regarding an act of a third party as an act of the defendant. So we will find that uh, Judge Jordan found maybe the elements are not fulfilled and maybe infringement is not established. Then he determined donkey can be vicariously liable if affirming infringement. Uh, Justice Burst found that the elements are satisfied and infringement is established. Donkey can be liable as a user in substance or jointly liable through common design. In contrast, Judge Baha found that the elements are satisfied and infringement is established. Donk is liable based on secondary liability. So, you could see the um, summary on the slide now. Uh, please uh, realise that these uh, answers have been simplified for the, for the uh, purpose of discussion today. So we are now going to have a discussion one by one from the each individual representative of the countries here today. From now on, we'll be going to be giving this panel discussion in English. Judge Shoji, could you please start? Okay, uh, let me explain about the reasoning in Japan. First of all, rules in Japan. 
In order for a product to fall within the technical scope of the invention, the product must satisfy all the elements of the invention and infringement by the use of a patent on invention of a product occurs when a product that satisfies all of the elements is used. Accordingly, if the use of a product that satisfies all of the said element can't be formed without combining the acts of multiple entities, patent infringement will not, in principle, be satisfied. However, from the viewpoint of proper protection of patented invention, if patent infringement can't be established at all in such case, it causes problems such that liability can be easily evaded by using the third party. The Japanese Product Act provides for indictment in, uh, indirected infringement for infringement by multi entities, but because cause where indirect infringement is established are uh, listed specifically, uh, there are not a few cases where infringing acts are carried out involving multi entities in a manner that does not constitute indirect infringement. Therefore, even when the use of a product that satisfies all of the elements can't be formed without combining the act of multi entities, liability shall be established depending on specific facts. In Japan, there is no Supreme Court precedent for which rules clearly on what circumstances would be su sufficient for establishing liability. At the same time, multiple approaches are discussed in judgment of inferior courts and academics. First, there is an opinion called tool theory. This is an opinion regarding a case where a person used the act of a third party as a pawn or a tool. According to according to this opinion, the act of third party regarded as a pawn or a tool shall be evaluated as having been performed by the entity who has utilized it. And the entity can be regarded as using a product satisfying all the elements by itself. There is also an opinion called control and the direction theory. According to this opinion, even when an act of a third party can't be regarded as a pawn or tool, as far as an entity controls and directs the act of the third party, the act of the entity shall be evaluated prescriptively to affirm its liability for infringement. Further, there is an opinion called Joint Direct Infringement Theory. According to this opinion, even when multiple entities dividedly implement the elements of a patented invention, as far as their objective relevance between actions of multiple persons and subjective relevance. They shall be evaluated as having performed jointly act of direct infringement and each actor shall be liable not only for the act performed of his her own but for the infringement as a well. whole. This opinion may seem to be during theory in academics, but at the same time, views are different on whether joint intention to commit infringing act jointly is essential and mutual understanding to what extent shall be sufficient. For now, there is no established theory and the theories now explained are not necessarily incompatible with each other. In the mock case, among the elements, especially whether 
measurement terminal in element B2 is satisfied or not in question. Considering the def definition in the scope of claims, a device that calculates the limb circumstantial length based on the limb shape data and transmits to it the lens edging unit can be regarded as a measurement terminal. Then, in the description, perhaps such as triple O9 states the promise that data is received and transmitted between parties at distance. Accordingly, the measurement terminal is not limited as to the physical location of the device or the matter of connections of said device. In the system, the data management device calculates the rim circumferential length and transmits the rim circumferential length data to the factory PC, which institutes the lens edging unit. Thus, the management device should be regarded as following under a measurement terminal. On the mock case, the court ruled if the acts of multiple actors can be regarded as interrelated and integrated, and if one of the multiple actors is aware of acts corresponding to the elements, and makes use of the acts of the other actors to receive the four elements, one of those multiple actors can be regarded as an entity who jointly infringes the patent with other parties. As I explained, there is no established theory and as to this issue, and it shall be noted that there is no established opinion of the IP High Court. The court, considering the nature of the mock trial, adopted to a theory similar to the joint direct infringement theory, according to the plaintiff's argument. On that premises, on the mock case, the, the court held that the act of donkey, turtle, and optician shelf were regarded as integrated, and there is a relationship that the donkey is aware of the system as a whole, and makes use of the act of turtle and the optician shops, while each of turtle and optician shops makes use of the act of donkey, based on the following factor. First, donkey knows much about the system. Second, under the counter contract with Turtle, Donkey makes Turtle operates the data management device of the system. And under the transaction agreement with the optician's shop, Donkey provides the optician's shop with a software and makes them install it in the shop pieces. Third, Donkey itself operates the system that supplies processed lens by using the factory PC the edger, and the lens shape manager. Accordingly, in the mock trial, Donkey was found to be liable for the infringement of the patent right to jointry with turtle and optician shops. I finish my brief explanation about the re reasoning in Japan. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Judge Shoji. Uh, next, I would like to see the decision by Judge Jordan from United States. Judge Jordan, uh, could you please explain the rules regarding joint patent infringement in the U.S. and your decision on the mock case? Yes, thank you. <coughs> First, um, I want to thank you for letting me be here, and uh, it's an honor. And I want to note also that although the the slide says that uh, this would be a decision from the U.S. I'm just one judge in the U.S., and since these other honorable judges see it a little different than I do, uh, I'm, I'm feeling a little lonely. Uh, 
In fact, maybe even a little embarrassed, Choto Hazakashi this. Um, but let me first note, uh, uh, in answer to uh, Judge Nakajima's question, that when it comes to joint or divided infringement in the United States, uh, the, the basic principle is uh, you have to have all of the elements used by um, a single user, but you can have that single user uh, have attributed to it the actions of somebody uh, under the direction or control or in a joint enterprise with that individual uh, entity or person. So in this instance, if there is infringement, uh, that is, if there is a, uh, an actual reading of the claims on the donkey system, I don't think there would be too much difficulty in saying that there would be um, liability based on a vicarious liability theory, since under U.S. law, the system would be used by at least a user putting it into practice, and that could be uh, either the optician shops or conceivably donkey and then having uh, whatever blanks there are filled in because of the vicarious liability be since the definition of direction or control uh, includes the conferring of a benefit and clearly there's a benefit conferred by the operation of the system. That's consistent with the Akamai test and the test for use of a system under Centillion in the U.S. Uh, case law. But I, but Here's the problem I had and why I put down uh, potentially uh, not infringing. In the materials provided to us, the data management device, which is what this all turns on, whether the data management device is a measurement device as described in the claim, um, becomes cloudy for me because the data management device doesn't just measure circumferential length. It does do that, and if that's all you're doing, all you're worried about, then I would readily agree that there's infringement. But in the materials provided, you'll see that the data management device does more than measure circumferential length. It also uh, makes judgments about whether or not the lens is going to be uh, a fit, whether it fits the tolerances and therefore can be used. In the claim language, under the C claims, that type of uh, information is done within the lens, lens edging unit. If you're, if you're looking at um, slide number slide number seven, thank you, then you'll see that uh, it says that the, the lens circumferential length and rim circumferential length received uh, are going to be determined, whether, whether the beveled spectacle can be fitted is going to be determined within the lens edging unit. But the data management device d seems to do that in the, in the accused device. So it can't be both in the frame measurement unit and in the lens edging unit. If it is, then it, then it can't be infringing, it, it seems to me. And, and so I, I would, before I could make a determination about infringement, I would feel like I needed to first have a, a hearing under Markman, we, we, a claim construction hearing, where I had a better sense of the definition of frame edging unit and lens, uh, excuse, frame measurement unit and lens, lens edging unit. And then I would be in a position to maybe uh, do a trial where I was the fact finder, or if there was a jury, perhaps it would go to a jury on whether this device management uh, uh, unit, that is the, the, um, the, excuse me, data management device, was within the frame measurement unit or the lens edging unit. So that's my explanation for why I'm, I was not as convinced uh, as my colleagues. Uh, 
Yeah. Uh, thank you, Judge Jordan. Uh, could you please explain some rules regarding the uh, vicarious liability in the United States? Sure. Under under uh, Akamai, uh, there is several Akamai decisions. Uh, Akamai Five is the um, is the in bank decision of the Federal Circuit. It says specifically that you can have vicarious liability uh, or responsibility for um, the actions of another if there is a direct control or uh, a power to direct or control the other's performance or where the actors are in a joint enterprise. Here, um, you could argue joint enterprise, but the most likely argument would be a direction or control because the definition of direction or control includes the conferral of a benefit and some control over timing. And I think that would be, that would be met under these circumstances because the conferral of the benefit is obvious. It's the operation of the system and the ability to get uh, fitted lenses appropriately coming back. Um, I should know one nuance here. When, typically, when we talk about vicarious liability in the United States, we are talking about some kind of agency relationship, so we're talking literally about liability. Here, we're using the words vicarious liability, uh, not specifically because there's an agency relationship, but because we're allowing in the uh, determination of whether every element of the claim has been met, whether the behavior of somebody can be attributed and that's the sense in which you're using vicarious liability. It's an analogous use. I hope that answered the question. Yes, thank you. Uh, well, uh, you just uh, explained about the vicarious liability. So uh, I would like to ask you that, uh, is it an, uh, right to understand that the rules for vicarious liability is basically applied just to uh, method patent. Well, yeah, Akamai was in a method claim, um, but you can, in Centillion, they specifically, which is a system claim decision, they looked uh, to uh, Akamai and made some decisions, I think, analogizing it and saying you could you could um, understand that the system is used, is put into use by a single party, even if that single party doesn't control every aspect of the case, every aspect of the uh, invention, um, because you can uh, take this Akamai principle and have it inform how the use is happening. Thank you. Uh, so, well. I would like to confirm one thing there. Uh, in the United States, uh, the rules for uh, method claims and the rules for uh, product claims seems different. I mean, uh, basically, uh, the Akamai rule would not be applied to the uh, uh, product claims. So. Uh, could you please tell me why uh, the rules for product patent and uh, method patent are different? Yeah, well, I can't answer that very, very well because I don't know all the thinking that was going on at the Federal Circuit when they were deciding Akamai. I can only tell you this. My understanding is that the method claim uh, uh, theory of vicarious liability is you have to have a step-by-step -step, uh, proceeding, right? I mean, every step in the method has to be done, and it has to be done in a way that would satisfy the claim, and that's the context in which Akamai was decided. Uh, when you got to Centillion, the court didn't get as, as tied up. It, it made reference to the Akamai uh, case, but its focus was on use, use of the system. And, and does a single party kick off that use and put the whole system into operation? And, and uh, in, in the case that we're dealing with here, this mock case, that's, that is clearly happening when the optician shop 
sends the data out. It moves the system into operation. So in one sense, you wouldn't have to get too far into the Akamai uh, work at all. You just look to Centillion and say they're using the system because the entire system is being put into operation. To the extent you needed to think about his each step being done, Akamai would answer, would help you answer that question. Every step is happening, uh, even if it's not happening directly through one person uh, doing all the same steps. I, I hope I'm being clear on that. Centillion's use theory is the whole system can be put into practice by one person, even if they're not controlling every piece of the system. Thank you, Judge Jordan. Uh, let's move to the United Kingdom. Uh, Justice Burst, uh, could you please explain the rules in the UK and your decision on the Mac case? Thank you very much. Um, and it's a pleasure to be here uh, in Tokyo. And can I congratulate the IP High Court for this ingenious mock scenario, which has managed to produce different answers from all the major patent jurisdictions in the world, I think, if we count Japan, the US, Germany, and the UK. Um, I think that's very clever. <laughs> so well done. Um, joint patent infringement. Uh, in the UK, one way of infringing a product claim is to use the product. Uh, and we've had cases in which the claimed invention is a system which comprises more than one computer separately located and interacting via the internet. And the question is whether a person who is sitting at one of those computers commits the act of use. Uh, in other words, are they using the claimed system? And you can assume, as here, that the system has a whole with the various components falls within the patent claim. I'll come back to the question about that in a minute. Um, now, the argument made by the defendant in these cases in the UK is that the person sitting at one of those computers is not using the whole system because the other computers are under the control of other persons. And this came before the Court of Appeal in a case called Menashe. Uh, and our courts decided that the question can be answered by asking whether the person is in substance using the system. And the importance of this expression, in substance, is it means that they don't have to do everything if you think that in substance, in, in reality, if you like, uh, they are the user. Uh, and even if it's true that other parts in a physically different place uh, are controlled by somebody else, someone who is in substance the user will be liable for patent infringement. Uh, it's fair to say part of the reason for the decision in Menashe was that there was a jurisdictional question because parts, the other computers, were not within the United Kingdom jurisdiction, uh, but the person who was in substance using the system was uh, within the jurisdiction. And that was a critical reason for the, for the analysis in the Menashe case. <clears throat> so if one asks the question, uh, in this case, assuming the uh, system does infringe, is Donkey the user? Uh, I would say that they are in substance using the system. And that would be true even though elements of the claim system involve parts under the control of the optician shops uh, and parts under the control of Turtle. Now that's not the same as joint infringement uh, in the UK, but just focusing on our joint infringement law, we have three theories of joint infringement. We have vicarious liability, which is the liability usually of a company for the acts of its employees. We have procurement, uh, where two people act together in concert, no, sorry, procurement, which is um, where somebody procures somebody else to infringe. And we have common design, in which two people act together in common to commit an act of infringement, and they will both be liable. And common design, this word design, means a common purpose. Uh, and it seems to me that common design analysis would apply in this case. So even if one was to say that Donkey's actions were not use in substance because of the involvement of other people, nevertheless, I think a UK court would look at this and say that all three of the entities, Donkey, Turtle, and the optician shops, are acting together with a common purpose to make spectacle lenses, uh, and that would make them liable. There's no requirement in UK law 
that this purpose has to involve knowledge of patents or knowledge about infringements, nor would I say does it matter and that we don't have a case that looks at this aspect, but I think my, my personal view would be uh, that it doesn't matter if the individual actors are not aware specifically of who the other actors are, as long as they are aware that they exist and they clearly know that there are other people out there, even if they don't know exactly uh, who exactly they are and what they're doing. That's enough. This purpose question is subjective. It is the, it is the court asking what subjectively uh, is the reason for the people doing what they're doing, but it's, it's not something which requires a careful proof of state of mind. It's something which the court will infer from all the circumstances of the case. So if, if this was in my court, I would say uh, that if the system does infringe the claims, then Donkey would be liable under the common design doctrine. So if I move on to the question of the, the claim construction question, in the UK, we distinguish between product claims and process claims or method claims. And this is a system claim, and certainly under English law, we regard that as a product. A system is a product. <clears throat> now, the issue is about the location of the thing called the measurement terminal, uh, because the accused system has a measurement, uh, it locates that in a different physical place from the rest of the thing called the frame measurement unit. Uh, and that's why there's an argument of non-infringement. And in the UK, we would approach this question by asking about the purpose of the various elements in the patent claim. And if you, I don't know if we can put the claim up, and it may not matter, but uh, if you look at the patent claim, it explains that the purpose of the measurement terminal is to perform two functions. They are a function to calculate something which is the rim circumferential length, and to transmit something, which is the data to the lens edging unit. So in terms of those purposes, I would say the skilled person reading the patent would understand that this purpose can be fulfilled regardless of the physical location of the measurement terminal. It can perform those purposes wherever it is. And so on that basis, Donkey's system infringes the patent. Uh, and so my conclusion, if this was in my court, would be that Donkey was liable for patent infringement. Thank you. Thank you very much. So uh, I would like to confirm some, uh, a, a, a couple of things. Uh, first, about uh, Menashe. Uh, Justice Burst, uh, Menashe showed a special consideration in a case involving a system claim as a product claim. Uh, when applying Menashe to the Moku case and finding Donkey a user of the system, uh, even though certain parts of the system are used by turtle and optician shops, doesn't, doesn't that constitute a special rule for system claim regarding joint or divided infringement? Well, <laughs> I mean, I think my honest answer is, in a way, yes, and in a way, no. <laughs> I'm sorry. The reason is, um, to call a system a product is slightly odd, because really a system is more than one product. Uh, but in our patent law, we, we, I guess you probably do the same in, in Japan, but it's certainly in UK patent law, our law draws a clear distinction between products and processes. And if you ask, well, is it a product, you have to put it in one category, the category is product. I don't have any difficulty with that. But it is a product which has pieces which are separate. And that's where this in substance idea comes from. Because when you have this separated product, then you can ask the, the question arises of what, how do you characterize the behavior of someone who is working with one piece of that product? So that's... I think, I think it is a special rule. Probably if there was another thing like a system, the same rule would apply to it, but I, I can't think what that would be. So additional question is, uh, would, would be there any change in your findings if the claim in the patent, in the mock case, were written as a method claim? I, I, I think the answer is no. Um, for, for a couple of reasons. First of all, 
in, in UK law, and again, I guess in Japan, but I don't know, um, the act of use, use is an act which infringes a process claim and, and a product claim. So the fundamental act is the same kind of act in, in both cases. It doesn't matter whether it's a method or a, or a product. Um, the analysis of uh, the in-substance aspect would seem to me to apply. I don't believe in, in the UK we've had a case in which we have looked at it that way because we regard systems as product claims. Um, so I, I can't give you a case which makes that decision, but I think, to my mind, the logic works the same way. And certainly for joint liability, for common design and the others, they are, the law is the same, whether it's a product or a process claim. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Justice Burstner. Uh, finally, from Germany. Uh, Judge Baha, could you please explain the rules in Germany and your decision on the case? Yes, thank you very much. And let me join my English colleague in congratulating you on this mock trial and the design of this mock trial. And there is one more thing in which I want to join my colleague from the UK. I think I agree with everything he has said about this case and about the liability of Donkey in that case. And this is remarkable in my view because the systems in the UK and in Germany are quite different. The legal concepts are quite different. And nevertheless, we come, to the, we come to the same conclusions. This is something which seems very important to me and which I hope will be the case in every mock trial in, in Japan in the future. Uh, now let's have a look at the legal concepts in Germany. Well, first of all, it is quite clear a patent is infringed only if all the elements are realized, are satisfied in a product or in a process. Uh, the other question is who is liable if all the elements are realized? And these questions are not regulated by the Patent Act, but by the general rules in the German Civil Code. And there are three concepts which I want to mention. They are, I think, quite similar, but nevertheless the wording is a little bit different. Now let's have a look at the next slide. The first concept is called joint tortfeasance. We call it Mittäterschaft. Uh, and this uh, applies if parties act together, cooperate consciously and deliberately. Uh, this concept is rather uh, rarely used because uh, it, it is only applicable if all the parties involved do not only know what they are doing and what all the others are doing, but all the parties have knowledge of the patent, which is not, uh, not uh, in every case to be proved. Therefore, another concept is very, very often used in Germany in such cases, and this is called secondary liability, or we call it Nebentäterschaft. This means, uh, also party who just act negligent, who don't know the patent, but should have known the patent, can be held liable together if they, well, if their combined actions cause infringement. I will refer to that in a moment. Let's have a look at the third concept, which is on the next slide. This is called interference liability, or if you ever read German decisions, it's called Störerhaftung. Uh, this is similar to the secondary liability, uh, but the, uh, first of all, the conditions are less strict, and for that uh, the consequences are less strict because an interferer is only liable for an injunction, but not for damages. But this concept mainly is applied in uh, trademark cases and in copyright cases. It 
only plays a minor role in patent cases. So the concept I want to focus on is the second, secondary liability or Nebentäterschaft. There are two major decisions from the Federal Court of Justice uh, which applied this principle in the recent years. The first one is called MP3 Player Import. Uh, there, the Federal Court of Justice said a person is, can also be held as direct infringer if he enables or facilitates infringement by another party. In this case, it was a carrier who just delivered or was, uh, was supposed to deliver infringing goods to a customer and it was held liable because they were informed that the products which they are bound to deliver infringe a patent and they did not take any action to, well, to prove whether or not this allegation is true. The second case, and I think this is the more important case for our mock trial, is called audio signal encoding. There, the Federal, Patent Co uh, the Federal Court of Justice uh, established a broader and more general approach. Now we said infringement is also uh, to established if a person uh, causes infringement by reproachable behavior. One of these examples of reproachable behavior is the MP3 player input case, not interfering in infringing acts, although having knowledge or should have knowledge of the infringing act. And the other scenario in which reproachable conduct is maybe established is if a person takes advantage of a fact that certain steps or certain elements are carried out by another party and can be used for his own purposes, can be included in his own action. In this special case, it was about encoding and decoding of an audio signal. It was encoded by a television company and it was decoded by the people who watched these programs and they acted together in this way that we said they both jointly uh, infringe this patent. And I think, uh, the, I think this is quite similar to our case and this is the reason why I came to my conclusion. Now, I can be brief on uh, the satisfaction of the elements. I think in my view the major uh, thing is uh, there must be a unit, a measuring unit, uh, and but the patent does not state that it has to be a physical unit, but it's sufficient if it is a functional unit. And as my uh, colleagues already explained, I also think that we have this functional unit and therefore all the features are realized. Then what about donkey's liability? I think I, if you uh, have one more look at the audio signal, encoding case, I think it's quite the same situation. All three parties involved knew that they are taking part in a system which only works if there are more components and while perhaps they did not know who is running the other components of the system, but this is not, uh, I think this is not relevant. It is sufficient that they knew there are, other com there are other components and they are run to achieve the results which should be achieved that a lens can be applied to, uh, to a spectacle. And I think this is what we would decide in Germany. Although there is no decision so far which uh, expressly uh, uh, addresses system claims. Audio MP3 was about products. Audio encoding was about processes. But I'm pretty sure that we wouldn't uh, apply another rule to systems claims. Uh, thank you, Judge Baha. Uh, well, now all countries have given presentations. 
Uh, considering the contents of the rules and discussions presented, um, we prepared uh, two topics for discussion from now, but the first uh, topic, uh, claim interpretation as to system claims, uh, was already uh, touched on by the three panelists uh, abroad. Uh, so uh, I would like to summarize it and then uh, ask the Japanese opinion about it. As for satisfaction of elements, uh, while Justice Burst and Judge Beha uh, directly consider the data management, device in the systems falls within the scope of element B2 uh, considering the function, uh, Judge Jordan scrutinized the elements and set the issue of whether the data management device is inside or outside the uh, outside of the frame measurement unit, and probably it derives from the structure uh, that in the United States uh, the claim construction is of course the judge's uh, liability, but uh, through Markman hearings after uh, the construction. Uh, uh, after the claim construction, uh, the factual, I mean, the, for example, the literal infringement is established or not, uh, the, the, so the application of the construction will be submitted to the jury as a question of matter. So probably he, the more uh, yeah, stricter, uh, stricter uh, interpretation was made to the uh, claim. Well, so uh, Judge Choji, uh, considering the uh, presentations made by uh, overseas panelists, uh, could you please tell us specifically how you interpreted the frame measurement unit, the measurement terminal, and their relation in the invention? Well, uh, I, I think uh, it's a very interesting difference. And before I mention my opinion, to understand such differences deeper, we should not how infringement shall be in determined in the US. Uh, for example, uh, uh, claim construction and satisfaction, satisfaction, uh, satisfaction of elements, a uh, question of law or a question of fact. How does uh, Markman hearing proceed, Judge Jordan? Could you explain it briefly? Sure, the Markman hearing does not. Uh, attend to the accused system at all. It's, a, it's an, an effort to uh, interpret the claim language itself. And so uh, the challenge here, for me at least, was understanding, leaving aside the question of what the data management device does in the accused system, understanding what the frame measurement unit consists of and what the lens edging management uh, uh, unit consists of, um, and that again, if you're if you're looking at the uh, uh, particular slide that's got the the claim language on it, I think it's slide nine um, uh, or, or slides eight and nine. It, it lays out what those things are, and and I would want to explore that in a little more detail to discover whether. Um, C3, which talks about how the lens edging unit has to make judgments about tolerances and whether or not the lens is, satis is satisfactory for use, uh, is something that is in fact in the lens edging um, unit and not in the frame management in the uh, frame measurement unit, because um, that's where I get hung up. Right? If if the only thing that matters in this case is that when you get to the infringement question, the data management device measures the circumferential length, then I'm actually right in line with uh, Lord Justice Burse and with uh, presiding Judge Becher, because um, it does. That seems to be undisputed. 
Um, the question at a Markman hearing would be, help me understand what happens in each of those two units that are claimed in the frame measurement unit and in the lens edging unit. Uh, that would be, put me in a position then to make a judgment as a matter of law. And at that point, it may well be that there is no question of fact and summary judgment would be rendered in favor of the plaintiff or the defendant, depending on, on how that claim construction hearing came out. But if it came out that there was still some question of fact about, okay, now where does the data management device fit, then that would be a question of fact that would be submitted to a jury if a jury had been requested. Thank you, Judge uh, Jordan. Uh, so, uh, Judge Soji, could you please explain the Japan's uh, viewpoint as to claim construction in the mock case? Sure. Judge Jordan's remarks persuasively formed the possibility of strict uh, literal construction and gave me a valuable insight. In my opinion, however, in light of claim structure and the problem to be solved, I consider in the invention a word unit can be grasped from its function, and a word terminal can also be understood from its functional aspect, considering the fact that it transmits necessary and sufficient data for calculation of rim circumference length, and that it is within common general technical knowledge that an dependent device into being when data is transmitted from one place to another. So I think it, uh, it's not important where is the management terminal is located. It's my opinion. Thank you. Thank you, Judge Shoji. Uh, well, can, I think... Can I mention something yes, here? Yeah, sure. I agree completely that the physical location is not significant. That's not the point. It is a functional question, and to my mind, the question is, what functions is the data management device performing? Because if it's performing functions that are covered by what the claim says are happening in, lens edge, in the lens edging unit, then that creates a, uh, a difficulty for me uh, because the, the, uh, the claims then would have difficulty reading on the, on the uh, accused system because the data management device is doing things that are happening in both the frame man measurement unit and the lens edging unit. Thank you, Judge, for the, uh, just, uh, thank you, Judge Jordan, for clarification. Well, so uh, let's move on the uh, next topic, I mean, the joint divided infringement. Well, uh, we have seen a stricter or a more theoretical way of reasoning in the U.S. presentation. I mean, uh, that is, rules for a product patent and a method patent are clearly distinguished. And as far as crafted as a product claim, a single entity that puts the entire system into service is necessary. I consider uh, attorney must have interest in this matter. Sure. So I have a one question to Judge Jordan. So uh, do you have any other points or tips uh, in, you know, the four patent applicants, uh, pat patentee uh, should be careful uh, to pay attention to when drafting a cl uh, claim uh, in relation to the joint uh, divided infringement? Yeah, this is uh, this is something that's 
caused consternation in the U.S. courts by the, the very fact that the Akamai case has got five different opinions. You can tell this was going up and down and up and down and causing a challenge. And one of the things that the Federal Circuit said, I think kind of wisely, was you could draft this in a way <laughs> that, that it would be a single user uh, uh, issued, uh, 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 and you would be able to avoid this problem. So there is a there is a skilled draftsman um, um, uh, issue here. I I I cannot pretend to uh, speak to that specifically, having having never drafted a patent claim in my life, although I've construed <laughs> many of them. I'm sorry. Yeah, but I th I think the the tip that came from the court was, you should particularly when it comes to system claims, you should be anticipating that this is going to involve more than one actor, and you should be drafting with that in mind. And if you draft with that in mind, you will be able to create claim language which avoids, uh, if not entirely, very largely the issue of divided infringement. That makes sense, yeah. Thank you very much. So, Mr. Shiroyama, what do you think about this matter from the perspective of Japanese attorney? Well, yeah, I agree that the uh, patent practitioners understand that the, a single user claim is uh, easier to enforce in general. But uh, in, in practice, I don't think it's easy to select the key factor uh, which will be the key for operation or suspension of the system at the time of drafting the claims. Although clever CFC judges may be able to do, but uh, <laughs> I don't think we can do uh, in a perfect way. And also, uh, the, I, I think that the innovation of mm. the technology and business uh, goes far beyond what we can imagine at the time of claim drafting. So, regardless of how careful, how carefully the claims are drafted, I don't think we can avoid the issues we are discussing here. Thank you very much. So I agree with you, and it's it's, it's very difficult to avoid uh, such kind of issues and uh, when uh, claim drafting and so uh, but you know that, that we should uh, you know <laughs> we, we will try but uh, yes yeah, a little bit different yes yeah. it's easy for oh. the judges to say <laughs> right <laughs> yeah <laughs> just but you have come, yeah please 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 uh, well m m may I just say one thing about this because um, I agree with you that you, we, we can't expect perfection in the drafting of patents. It's not possible. Uh, and the for foresight of what will happen. And that's why um, many countries have a doctrine of equivalence. Um, you, you may like to know, in my country, uh, the earliest decision I know in our doctrine of equivalence was the very first telecoms patent case in 1915, when Mr. Marconi was complaining that someone was copying his invention. Uh, and the judgment in that case, Mr. Justice Parker, uh, decided we had a doctrine of equivalence. We lost it in the 1980s, and it came back again about three years ago. So our doctrine of equivalence comes in and out over a century. Uh, but we are currently, we have one, and it's the answer, I think, or part of the answer to the problem that you're describing. I totally agree with the judge, and the doctor, doctrine of equivalence is uh, also very, very uh, interesting and important issues. But we don't have time to yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, deep into the, the doctrine of equivalence. Yeah. Okay, so uh, finally, I would like to touch on the topic of uh, liability as well of church and of teacher shops, just briefly. Uh, in the mock case, at least as to the use of the system, it may be said that the church is not much involved in the operation of the system, and opposition shops may not be even aware of the involvement of church in the system. Uh, considering those factors, how shall liabilities of church and opposition shops be determined? Judge Katsumata, uh, what do you think about this matter in Japan? 
Uh, yes, uh, in my opinion, it is not difficult to find turtle liable for patent infringement when we consider its contractual relationship with Donkey and its full knowledge of the system. But on the other hand, there could be discussion on whether opticians shops are liable or not. But I think if they are aware of the structure and function of the system uh, they operated by Donkey and Tador, it leads the affirmation of their liability for infringement. And it does not depend on whether they are uh, specifically aware of the existence of Tato or not. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Uh, I think Justice Burr has already mentioned this point. So, uh, Judge Bahar, uh, could you please uh, explain how you found the li liability of Turtle and the optician shops? Yes, thank you. I think the reasons are quite the same as for Donkey itself, because in my view, all the, three, all the three of them worked together purposefully. The purpose was, well, to get lenses which fit into spectacles. Each of them knew that they took part in the system, and each of them, well, took some profit from participating in the system, and therefore I think uh, based on our on our concept which was applied in audio encoding system uh, there's no substantial difference between those three parties and therefore all the three of them should be held liable for taking part in this system thank you very much well uh, we are now running short of time so uh, judge shoji uh, could you please wrap up the part one of the panel discussion. Sure. Uh, I'd like to have a few words for wrapping things up. It was interesting to see uh, various legal framework and ways of reasoning. Today, we have focused patent infringement by marriage parties but it has turned out that this topic does really as a legal framework like the system of fact-finding. Of course, we should note we have seen only a part of patent protection relating to patent infringement by marriage parties, so I would, I would be more uh, up, appropriate to examine this matter broader, for example, including other legal framework such as indirect infringement. Sometime, yet it was fruitful. It was very fruitful discussion. Thanks all participants. And that concludes my wrap-up remarks. Thank you for the, your attention. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. The part, is now, part one is now over. Thank you very much. This concludes the first part of the panel discussion, International Comparison of Joint Patent Infringement. Thank you very much to all the speakers.